Man, we're so blessed with an incredible pastor, incredible team, and a worship team. Man, we are on. It's just, it's just a great place to be. Well, again, we're so glad you're here today. What an incredible day already. I do want to mention that on the way in, most of you got a little index card. And if you're here last week, we mentioned this. But if you don't know what the index card is about, we, uh, we as a team want to pray for you. We want to pray specific prayers for what God is doing in your life. And so the question I'd love for you to answer on that card is if you could ask God to do anything, if you could ask God to do anything, what would you ask him to do? And if you don't mind, just fill that out sometime during the message or during our closing today and just fold it and bring it and lay it here at this altar. Our team is going to pray for you this week. And the next Sunday, if you're able to be with us, we're going to put into practice what Philippians says about praying about everything. And we're going to be at a special time of prayer. And I hope you, that you'll be here and be part of that. But if you have your Bibles, look at Philippians chapter 3. We've been teaching through this idea of joyful. And the idea is a lot of us are showing up joyless. In fact, I was listening to an interview with a writer named John Eldridge. I don't know if any of you have read John Eldridge's books. One of his best-selling books is called Wild at Heart. And it's helped so many men I know connect with the heart of God and, and really uh, see relationship through a different lens. But I was listening to this conversation and honestly, at first, when I was listening to the conversation, I was like, yeah, I, don't, I just sort of had it on in the background while I was working out a couple weeks ago. And then as I was listening to it, I was like, wow, this is really powerful. John Eldridge writes books, but he's also a psychologist, and so he counsels people, and he takes men on uh, events that similar to something that God's brewing here at Sugar Hill Church. But one of the things that he said that just stood out to me is he said that people are tapped out. And that phrase just stood out to me. People are tapped out. He said, over the last two years, when you think about the global trauma we have walked through, people aren't in a good place. And I've sensed that, right? And maybe you've sensed that, right? I've looked around and there's friends that I've had to unfollow on social media because there's just so much anger spewing out of what they do. And there's uh, relationships that I felt some distance in that wasn't there a couple years ago. And there's things going on inside of me that I'm like, man, this is different. And so when I was listening to this, I thought this is so true. He said, people are tapped out. You go through two years of a global trauma where there's a lot of stress in our life. And there's no finish line. And I'm one of those people that I can put up with almost anything if I know where the finish line is. Are any of y'all like that? Like I can, I can buckle down and like there's the finish line. But when it comes to something like a global trauma event, there's no finish line. It's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And, and just when you think you're done, you, there's another one. I, one of the comedians I like to listen to is a guy named Jim Gaffigan. And he's got like five or six kids. And, he's, and, and people, he, he jokes about the idea. He said, people are like, what's it like to have six kids? And and uh, he said, well, imagine that you're in the pool and you're drowning and somebody throws another baby at you. It's like, awesome. Uh, awesome. Some of us feel that struggle, right? When, just when you thought you're on the other side. And he said, man, you, you have high stress situation where there's no, no finish line, where everything that used to be normal has changed and everything that you used to enjoy was taken away from you. No wonder people have no reserves, you know what I mean by reserves, like something in the tank that you can tap into. It's sort of like a, a battery that you haven't used in a while, and you go to crank the thing, and it doesn't crank, and you're like, are you kidding? What's up? There's nothing there. And it would be different maybe if two years ago everybody had full reserves, right? Maybe if everybody walking into March 2020 was living a wholly healthy life and they had tons of reserves, maybe they would have been more resilient over the last two years. But if we're honest, I don't think anybody went into 2020 with full reserves, right? I think already we were tapped out. I think already we were stressed out. Already our schedules had no white space on them. I think already emotionally we were drained and already we we're trying to keep up with everybody else. And, front to, and so a lot of us came into this last two years already depleted to some degree, maybe a little bit, but a lot of people were already at empty. And then you throw trauma and you throw two years of uncertainty and you throw in all of this stuff. And there's a lot of people that are just tapped out. I don't know if you felt that. If you're like, man, if another thing happens. Then we come to books like Philippians. And we talk about joyful and 
And we read verses that say rejoice, 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 rejoice. And on the outside, that sounds good. So we try to put a front on. We try to smile a lot. And we try to act like everything's okay. While on the inside, for most people, it's still not okay. On the outside, we're rushing to act like the last two years haven't been difficult. We're trying to jump back in. And man, we're seeing people travel like more, vacations like more, uh, job changes like more. And we're trying to, to, to just push forward and forget that you cannot erase the last 700 plus days of trauma by taking a seven-day vacation. Right? You can't undo two plus years of anxiety and two plus years of not normal and two plus years of all the stress and strain and think, man, if I could just take one vacation, everything's going to be good. That's, that's not enough to re replenish us, right? Uh, one week away, a long weekend, uh, two weeks during the summer at the beach cannot undo in a moment what two plus years has done to our souls. Are you all tracking with me? And so no wonder a lot of us are on edge. No wonder a lot of us are reacting instead of responding to the world around us. And I think about what Paul says. And so what I want to do today, if you're a note taker, I'd love for you to make a stop list. You know, a lot of times we make a to-do list, right? We, I don't know if you are to-do kind of people. I love having a to-do list. I go into my day trying to figure out what are the top three things I've got to do, and then what are the other things. And, and if I find myself at the end of the day having done stuff without having a list, I'll make a list just so I can check it off. Anybody else like that? You like the progress of that? So a lot of times we make to-do lists, but today I want to invite you to make with me a to-don't list. There's some things I don't want to do launching into a new season, into the fall, into the rest of 2022 and 23. And so it's not fancy. It's not polished. It's just a list of things that I'm saying based on Philippians 4, I do not want to do. If you have your Bibles, look at it. Towards the end of Philippians 3, there's a, a couple of paragraphs that transition us very well into chapter 4. It's Paul's writing. He's writing from jail. He's locked up. He's had all kinds of, and we'll talk more about that uh, throughout this. But listen to what he says in verse 19. He's describing the world. And Pastor Chuck did an amazing job last week describing Philippians 3. If you missed the message, I want to encourage you to go check out the replay on YouTube or Facebook or church app. But he talks about the dogs in the world. He's talking about the enemies in the world that are ripping stuff apart. And he describes them. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 3, he says, For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So he's saying, look, out there, there's a lot of enemies. There's a lot of people that are opposed to the things of Christ. Verse, 13, uh, verse 19, he says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. And their mind is set on earthly things. And so he's describing people that are just living from the lust of life, living from their own desires, living for themselves, really. And so as he describes this, he's, he says, look, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their, uh, uh, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame and their mind. Look at this phrase at the end of verse 19. Their mind is set on what? On earthly things. Right? They're, they're just looking at the earth around them. They're, they're, their mindset is set on all of the junk around them. And then listen to what he says in verse 20. He starts with this one little word. He says, but... He's making a distinction. He's saying these dogs that are out here, they're living for themselves. They're, they're, their end's going to be destruction. They're, they're living out their own desires. And then he says in verse 20, but our citizen, he's making a line of demarcation. He's saying there's something different about us. He's saying to every believer, there's, there's, there's a distinction. You're not like the rest of the world. Your mind isn't to be set on the things of the world. He says, but our citizen is in where? It's in heaven. And when I used to think about my citizenship in heaven, a lot of times I would think, well, this earth is just temporary, and one day I'm going to go home to heaven. And certainly there's some truth in that. 
But as I dug into this over the last couple of weeks and thought about this phrase, citizen in heaven, what Paul's actually saying is instead of me leaving earth and escaping this world and making it to heaven, he's saying, man, your, your heart is in heaven. And so our job is to bring the culture of heaven down to earth while we're still here. Does that make sense? It's sort of like watermelon at one sweet day. You could have it plain out there if you want to. And you're a weirdo if you don't like salt on it. Anybody like salt on your watermelon? I think that's the only only way to eat watermelon. Give me a, a watermelon, give me a salt shaker. And then if you're adventurous, you can go over and have sugar hell espanol drizzle a little of that on top of it, right? And so what they're doing is they're bringing a little bit of their culture to where they live now, right? It's almost as if you're from, a, I'm from Mississippi. And so in Mississippi, we like everything fried. Can I get an amen on that? We like fried catfish and fried shrimp, and we like fried hush puppies. Any hush puppy fans this morning? I don't want one hush puppies. I don't want two hush puppies. Bring me a bushel of hush puppies. You know what I'm saying? And so I want to bring a little bit of my culture here. It's like when you go to mama's house and you learn the, the secret recipe, you bring that recipe where you live now. And so what Paul is saying is we're citizens of heaven, and so instead of setting our minds on the things of the world, let's bring a little bit of heaven down to earth. It's almost like somebody, oh yeah, Jesus prayed on earth as it is what? In heaven. So what would happen if we begin to realize my citizenship primarily is in heaven? And what if we decided instead of setting my mind on the things of the world, I set my mind on heaven and I brought heaven down to earth? Well, for me, what that's meant is there's some things I got to stop doing. And so here's the don't do list. Let's make a to don't list together today. They're not fancy. They're not flashy. But the first one I'd love for you to write down and you can trek along in the app as well is number one, I will not fuel my fear. I will not fuel my fear. I'm not going to do it. We live in a world that likes to play on people's fear. You know that, right? We live in a world because fear gets people's attention. You could say nice things all day, but if you want to win a political race or if you want to uh, get somebody to watch your TV show, if you want somebody to sit through the commercial, the idea is you got to lead with fear. In fact, in psychology, they call, there, there's a thing that media uses called FUD, F-U-D, F-U-D, the F stands for fear, the U stands for uncertainty, and the D stands for doubt. And so the idea is for a news program to make money, they need sponsors. And for sponsors to say, hey, I want to pay, I, I'm willing to pay you money to show my commercial, they need eyeballs on the, on the screen, right? They need to suck you in. And the best way that they know psychologically is to lead with fear. 70% of our population has a personality that is fearful at its core. And so what they found is if we push the fear button enough, people are going to pay attention. Well, what's happened for a lot of believers is we've gotten sucked into that. We're living in a place of fear. We're living from this position of, man, I'm just afraid. 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 I mean, that's, I don't know if you watch the, the evening news. I don't typically watch it on TV, but I, I download the podcast version of it, the audio version of it. And once you get rid of all the commercials, that 30-minute news program is only about 22 minutes. And every single time, it follows the same format. It always opens with breaking news. I don't even know what the definition of breaking news is, right? Because some days there really is a, a global thing going on. A lot of times they're just making something up, right? Breaking news, breaking news. And then they list sort of the headlines and all the headlines tease you. They don't tell you what the actual end result is. They're like, um, and then... I, I, I can't do it off the spot, but you know what I'm saying? They lead with just sort of the teaser. And then you watch... Out of 22 minutes, you watch 19 minutes of fear, uncertainty, doubt, fear, uncertainty, doubt. Everything's falling apart. Uncertainty, we don't know what the future's going to be. Doubt, maybe it's not going to work out. Fear, hey, your life is falling apart. The economy is sinking. Uh, things are getting worse, worse, worse. Uncertainty, I don't know what tomorrow. Doubt, 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 doubt. And then the last one minute to two minutes, they have some happy little story at the end. And Right? I, I pay attention, right? The next time you do it, it's, it's such a predictable formula. And what the danger of that is, is that if we're not careful, we'll allow all of these inputs into our life that fuel our fear. And what I've found, at least in my own life, is usually the thing I fear the most is like an indicator of where I'm trusting God the least. If you're a believer, 
the creator of the universe rescued you. I mean, that's why we sing about reckless love. It's not, it's not like God has, you know, come unhinged. It's that God loves you so much that when God loves, he gives his son. And so God leaves heaven and he comes to this earth and he makes it possible for us to have a relationship with him, to have our sins forgiven, to have the peace of God in our life. Why would we follow the Prince of Peace? Why would we say, God, I want the God of peace to step into my heart and then fill my ears, my eyes, my mind with everything that is opposite of peace? And so I don't know about you, but for me, on my to-don't list is I don't want to fuel my fear. Could Paul have lived in fear? Absolutely. Paul was locked up in jail. He was in Rome. I don't know if any of y'all have been to Rome, but you can visit what's believed to be the jail cell. It's really a dungeon. Unfortunately, it was under renovations or something when we visited several years ago, so we didn't get to go into the maritime prison. But you can see it. You can see the sign. It's there by the forum. And so Paul's in jail. His, his situation honestly was a hundred times worse than anything I've ever lived through. Uh, the politics of his day were crazy. Uh, they, they, uh, the sexuality of his day was out of control. Uh, the human sacrifices that were going on, Christians being hated, the gladiators, you know, people watching gladiators die for sport. I mean, Paul could have focused on everything that was wrong, but listen to what he says in chapter four, verse four. He says, rejoice. What's interesting is after the resurrection of Jesus, there's not one negative thing mentioned in the New Testament. Were there negative things in the environment around them? Absolutely. Was there a lot of junk that could have gotten Paul's attention? Absolutely. But instead, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And so we get to decide what we're not going to do. And I'm saying, I want to invite you to consider, number one, I will not fuel my fear. What does that mean? There's some things I don't watch anymore because I found myself being fearful. There's honestly some relationships I've had to step back from because every time I was in around those relationships, I walked around feeling sort of grimy or I, I couldn't put my finger on it, right? I, I, you know, I'm not talking about writing people off, but I'm saying if there's, a, if there's a conversation that always pushes your buttons, if there's a show that's always causing you to live in fear, if there's something that's overriding, rejoicing in the Lord, maybe that's a thing that you want to put on the list. Maybe for me, number one, I will not fuel my fear. Number two, if you're up for saying there's some things we're not going to do, if you're up for quitting some things this week, not only would I say I will not fuel my fear, but number two, I will not flirt with quitting. I'm not flirt with quitting. One of the temptations, I think, for anybody, and it's understandable, I'm not beating anybody up today. I'm saying, man, I'm, I'm part of this message. I'm living this out, is to say I, I will not quit. Paul says in verse 1, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Here's his encouragement. He says, do you see this phrase? Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. Paul has figured out how to live with resiliency. Paul's resolute. When I think of stand firm, he's like firmly planted. Last night we went to the Josh Groban concert down at Chastain Park. I lost my man card when I went, but... He lifts me up. Anyway, so um, a lot of y'all, I asked for tips on Facebook about Chastain Park, and people kept saying, don't. <laughs> we love, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to know, am I missing something? But we went, and uh, everybody's dressed up all fancy, and there's this girl that had on these huge wedges, and I'm watching her walk behind her man down the steps holding onto his shoulder. I was like, all right, fashion over function, right, you know? She couldn't stand firm. There's something about standing firm. There's something about saying, I'm going to stick with it. And so Paul is living resolutely. Paul is living with courage. If you're here last week for chapter 3, as pastor walked through chapter 3, uh, Paul almost has this sense of, hey, we're part of the army, right? We're, we're military. Hey, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Uh, uh, don't quit. Don't quit. This interview I was listening to with John Eldridge is where I got that idea that seven days at the beach cannot erase 700 plus days of trauma. There, he didn't say it exactly like that, but there's something that, that made me think about that. And one of the things that the inter interviewer, a friend of mine, Kerry Newhoff, said in it, uh, he said that, um, that the answer to an unsustainable pace is not a vacation, right? A vacation will not fix 
an unsustainable pace, the answer to an unsustainable pace is to figure out an actual sustainable pace. And one of the signs that we're living on empty is when we are tempted to quit. And he says, look, stand firm. So number one, I will not fuel my fear. Number two, I'm, another thing I'm going to stop doing is I'm not going to flirt with quitting. And st- when things get tough and we're, right? And I've talked to a lot of teachers that are like, man, I don't know if I can go into another school year. I'm thinking about quitting. I talked to people that are in the front lines in the healthcare industry. It's been, it's been so hard and they're thinking about quitting. And so I would just, maybe the thing is to quit flirting with quitting and say, man, I'm going to stand firm. Number three, if you're thinking about things to quit, number three, I will not take the bait of bitterness. I will not take the bait of bitterness. Uh, it's sort of like my fishing friends when they go fishing on Lanier. There's a lot of, you know, where do you go and what kind of lure do you use and da-da, right? And, and, and there's the sense, hey, if I put the right thing is in, I'm hoping a fish is going to bite down and that fish that bites is going to get hooked. And that's what bitterness does in our life. At first, we feel justified. When things go wrong, we're like, well, of course I have the right to, to be bitter. Of course. And what we don't realize is that bitterness creates a calloused heart. Bitterness creates the sense of entitlement. Bitterness is a bad pill to swallow. I started to say a bitter pill to swallow, but that seemed too rhymy. But you know what I'm saying? Bitterness is dangerous. It really is. And again, I'm not faulting anybody. I mean, none of us went into 2020 with full reserves. And so I'm not faulting when we feel these things. Feelings are real. I would just say our feelings aren't always right. And a lot of times we're allowing feelings to direct us instead of the truth of what God says. And so listen to the way Paul describes this. Again, if you've been here, you've heard the context. He's in jail. He, 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 before Christ, he literally persecuted Christians. He put them to death. Jesus radically changed his life. He goes off the scene for a number of years to build his faith. He comes back onto the scene. He becomes the, the missionary of the New Testament. And he plants all these churches. And in the process of doing the right thing, people questioned his motives. People spread lies about him. People literally at one point, they picked up stones and they hurled them at him, trying to kill him. At one point, he was shipwrecked. Literally, I've never been shipwrecked. Have you been? He not just stranded on the side of the road because he got a nail in his side. He was shipwrecked, left for dead on an island, bitten by a snake. And yet, here's what he says, not based on how he felt, but based on what he's true. He says in chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, think about these things. I love that. In other words, we get to decide what we think about. Pastor Chuck uh, put a quote on his blog this week that I thought was so good. Not everything you think is true. Don't believe everything you think. And so Paul, Paul's calling this out. He's saying, man, if you want to consider what are the things to think about, is it true? Well, a lot of the things that we get worked up about aren't actually true. The way that you know something's true is if you could go into a court of law and you could prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, a lot of the stuff we feel feels real, but it's not always right. There's usually more to the story. There's a lot more gray than there is black and white. And a lot of the things that we say, well, of course it's true. They meant to do that. They, I can't believe those people, right? Whatever's noble. Well, is this noble? Is this the right thing? Is this uplifting? Is this helpful? Is it right? Is it, he says, whatever's pure and lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, these are the things that you think about. And so I, I, this is a warning sign for all of us. Don't let bitterness take root. Some of the signs I, I've seen in my own life and the lives of others when bitterness is setting in as we feel worthless. Man, I've talked to a lot of people after these two years. They're like, man, I don't even have what it takes to be a good parent. I don't have what it takes to be a good friend. And I don't have what it takes to... Uh, worry. And, and suddenly, because of the trauma, they feel worthless. Another sign is bitter resentment where man, they just resent everything, 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 everything. Self-pity, all right? We throw our own pity party. Uh, possessive, we start holding on, fear that we might lose something. Self-indulgence, we, we feel like so, so much has been taken out of us that, of course, we deserve. And sometimes people are turning to uh, substances, or they're turning to illicit relationships, or pornography, or overwork, or whatever the drug of choice is to, to self-medicate. Sometimes it's self-protectiveness. That they're so afraid of being hurt that they, that they get hard hearts from it. 
They can't be known. Self-centeredness. They feel like the world, and what ends up happening is our soul shrivels up. And I get it. I get it. There's a lot of people that are bitter. And I'm not saying that we can't feel what we're walking through, but what I am saying is don't let it linger. Right? If you're to leave church today and you're to get on the Peachtree Industrial to go home and you get in a long line of cars and the light turns green and the cars wait like 20 seconds to go so that by the time you get up to the light and the lights turn red again and you get to wait longer because some knucklehead doesn't know how to press the gas. Oh, that's for me. Sorry. It turned into a counseling session for me. Laura's like, I can't believe it. Right? It's not in my notes. I should probably stick to my notes. I should stick to my notes. I'm not saying don't feel your feelings. What I am saying is maybe give yourself a window. Hey, for 90 seconds, I'm going to go off. I can't believe this. I'm going to be a whole three minutes late to getting my taco or whatever. (laughs) Everything's better with tacos. Give yourself some space, but at some point, we got to move forward. Does that make sense? Give yourself, right? It's okay to be human. None of us are perfect at this. But what if we, instead of staying there and getting bitter, and this is heartbreaking for me because you know, our team talks a lot about how blessed we are to serve at Sugar Hill Church. This is, I think, the best church on the planet. I talk to a lot of pastors based on my past of traveling and speaking and just the places that God's put me over the years. I've got a lot of friends that are at other churches that are off. They're really hard. And there's a stat, the last I heard, that 41% of pastors, people in ministry, not just the lead pastor, but people in ministry are considering walking away from the ministry because of how hard the season's been. And I've talked to pastors that have gotten bitter. And Jay, again, I'm so grateful. This has been a, this is such a wonderful place to serve, but there's a lot of pastors that are walking away. And, and I think about in healthcare, there's people walking away. I think about our, our teachers, they're walking away. And I would just encourage you, don't let bitterness take root. Don't let bitterness take root. And I, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm just saying, don't take the bait. Number four, if you're making a to don't, not to-do list, number four, I will not cave to compromise. I will not cave to compromise. A lot of times when seasons are tough, it's tempting to compromise. Paul says this in verse 11. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. And so there's a lot of context here. I would encourage you to keep reading through the book of Philippians. But he says, I'm not writing you this because I'm in need. And then listen to what he says in verse 11. For I've learned to be content. Do you see that word content? Up until recently, anytime I thought about content, I equated contentment with settling. Which in our world, you know, in in the American way of up and to the right, settling is a bad thing. But actually, there's a good form of contentment. It's not laziness. It's not dropping your guard. It's not lack of ambition or drive. It's learning that our contentment doesn't come in stuff. Like for Paul, it's not his paycheck. For Paul, it's not his prison cell or a penthouse. For Paul, it's not do I have a lot of friends or no friends. Paul was so single focused on Jesus. He said this one thing I do right over and over again through all of his writings. At some point, his eyes got off of stuff and he realized I don't want to follow God just for stuff. I want to follow God because of who he is. There came a moment where he quit looking at God's hands. God, what can you give me, give me, give me? That he began to trust the heart of God. And he's like, God, I'm so committed to your heart that whatever situation you put me in, I'm going to look and figure out how can I see that as a way to point people to you. And so as he describes this, he says, I've learned what it is to be content, whether, uh, whatever the circumstances. Verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living uh, in plenty or in want. He's like, look, I've, I've had it all. Man, I, I used to be the center of attention before conversion. I used to be this guy that was great at being bad. I used to do all of this stuff. I've, I've had plenty. There's been times where I've lived in luxury and comfort, and I've had all, everything that I ever wanted. I've also been in moments where I'm in jail, and I don't have what I need He says, but I've learned to be content. And he says this in verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. For Paul 
His contentment wasn't stuff. It was a relationship with Jesus. And I get it. When I teach, I teach with lists. And I've got a list today, but I just acknowledge that the solution to contentment and to filling our reserves isn't making another to-do list. Maybe it's part of the to-don't list is to don't schedule my life away so that I have no time to actually sit with Jesus. We live in a world that is attacking our attention. And one of the best solutions is to just sit and be present with Jesus. And that's against my wiring. My wiring is, here's what I need to do. Do, 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 do. I need to sleep more. I need to exercise more. I need to eat right. I need to do, do, do. What if I need to stop and just be? Because it's a relationship. It's not about more head knowledge. It's not more about, do I have this all fear? It's a relationship. In fact, I would encourage you, John Eldridge, the guy that I've been referencing in this interview, a couple years ago, he wrote sort of a book that was about, you know, creating emotional space in your life. And they released a free app called the One Minute Pause, the One Minute Pause. And it's an absolutely free app. And within it, this year, they released a 30 days to resiliency thing. And so it's like 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night. I know some of you are like, man, I, I, the only way I get 10 minutes is if I sit in the garage before coming, right? So I get, but what would happen if we just sat with Jesus? I will not cave to compromise. The last thing, number five, number five, I will not be short-sighted. I will not be short-sighted. I will not be short-sighted. What I mean by that is because something is true now does not mean that it's true forever. And sometimes we get this fatalistic kind of mentality, this catastrophic mentality that just because things are hard today, we think, well, this is the way it's always going to be. And I get it. When, when our reserves are empty, it can feel that way. And everything seems to, to feed that. But what's interesting for Paul is while he's locked up in jail, uh, he's in Rome that has crazy politics, twisted sexuality, uh, people being murdered, Caesars being worshipped as God. And yet listen to this little phrase. When I first read it, honestly, I missed it. Then when I started coming back to it, I was like, think how powerful this is. Look look at the way he ends this in verse 22. He says, all of God's people. So he's writing this letter to other Christians. And he's like, hey, all, all the believers here that are with me, all God's people here send you greetings. Right? That's, that's a polite thing to do. It's like when you're hanging out with friends, they're like, hey, when you see your mama, tell, tell her I said hello. Right? That's what we do in the South. How's your mama and them? Right? And uh, I thought that'd be funny. It wasn't awesome. Um, <laughs> hey, tell them I said hello. Tell them. So Paul's doing that. He's like, all the Christians here say hello. And then I started thinking about, well, where is he? Well, he's in a pagan city that worships false gods. Where is he when he says all the Christians here say hello? He's locked up in a jail cell. Where is he? He's in Caesar's rule. Caesar, who many of their day worshiped as God. And listen to what he says. All of God's people here in jail, where I'm locked up in Rome, in the middle of this pagan society that has the pantheon just across the street and all of this false worship going on. He says, all the people here, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. In other words, even in a dark dungeon, even locked up in jail, even when things seemed to be falling apart, the light of the gospel was penetrating the household of Caesar himself. And I guess the reminder for me, I don't know if that resonates, I don't know if that clicks with you, but even in the darkest moments, the light of God can still shine through. And so when we are in that fatalistic mentality of, well, the world is falling apart and this relationship is dissolved and nothing's ever going to be, look how bad the world is out there. Even in the middle of darkness, God has the amazing ability to reach into the middle of the darkest moment and pull out something good. If Caesar's household can get saved by a guy in jail, God can do anything. God can do anything. And so today, I, again, this isn't fancy. This isn't polished. But my hope is it's super practical to say there's some things that we can stop doing. You've got the power of choice. I've got the power of choice. We get to decide what we think about. 
We get to decide, am I going to fuel my fear or am I going to live by faith? We get to decide, am I going to let bitterness be the thing that defines me or am I going to say, God, even when things are hard, I'm still going to stay thankful and grateful. That when we're tempted to quit, we say, I'm going to quit the things God tells me to, but if God hasn't told me to, I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to think about things that are noble and peaceful and right. And I'm going to learn that even when things aren't great, it doesn't mean that God's not at work. I'll close with this, and then I've asked the team to lead us before we head out. Um, years ago, I spoke at a school, and sometime I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll get invited to do like a drug or alcohol-free kind of talk or sometimes leadership kind of stuff, and I love doing it. But I was at the school years ago, and they had sort of a mural on one of the hallways. And I tried to find the source of it. It's like this Native American little poem. It's not very long. But as I was trying to research it, everything just came back unknown. unknown. But I saw this mural, and I thought it was super powerful. It's not right out of the Bible, but it, it, I, I think it's similar to what Paul is saying here. It's called The Eagle and the Wolf. And it went something like this. It painted on that wall. It said, there's a great battle that rages inside of me. One side of the battle is the soaring eagle. Everything the eagle stands for is good and true and beautiful. And it soars above the clouds. And even though it dips down into the valleys, it lays its eggs on the mountaintops. Inside of me is an eagle and a wolf. The other side of me is this howling wolf. And that raging, howling wolf represents the worst that's in me. He eats upon my downfalls. He justifies himself by his presence in the pack. Right inside of me, there's this eagle and this wolf. The eagle represents everything that's good and right and noble and wonderful. But there's also this wolf that wants to devour. And at the end of this little poem, it has one little question. It says, which one wins this great battle? Which one's going to win, the eagle or the wolf? And somebody wrote in at the bottom, the one that you feed. The one you feed. Inside of us, there's this battle. Am I going to get sucked into the things of this world and let the world convince me of worldly thinking? Or am I going to put my faith in God and say, God, I'm going to starve the worldly thinking and I'm going to feed the heavenly thinking because my citizenship is not on this earth. My citizenship is in heaven. And if I'm a citizen of heaven, what I think about is whatever's true. What I think about is whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure and lovely and admirable. If anything is excellent, if anything's praiseworthy, these are the things I'm going to think. Let's feed that. Would you pray with me this morning? Would you bow your heads for a moment and close your eyes? This morning, for those that that know Christ personally, if there's been a moment you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, but man, you've been wrestling like we've all been wrestling with, how to have the mindset of heaven. Maybe this morning you want to Just say in your head and your heart, dear Jesus, help me to think about the things that you want me to think about. And maybe there's some hurt. Maybe there's resentment. Maybe there's some bitterness that has taken root. Not again, I don't blame anybody. I think that's, we're doing the best we can. But maybe today God would have you to let go of some of that. Maybe it's through the prayer card that you leave at the altar. Maybe it's talking to somebody after the service. Maybe it's reaching out through the website. But maybe today there's something you need to drop off and say, God, would you help me to keep my eyes on you? But maybe today there's some of you that don't know Christ personally. And so the reason why you haven't experienced peace is that you don't know him yet. If that's you, maybe you take a moment to say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sin separates me from you. But I believe you died on the cross and I believe you're alive today. As best as I know how, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and save me. 
that's you, if you prayed that for the very first time, I'd love to talk with you this week. You could uh, drop us an email at prayer at sugarhillchurch.com. Uh, you could put it on your note card that you leave today. You could email us through the website as well. We'd love to talk with you about what it means to know Christ and how to take that next step. And in just a moment, when I finish praying, we're gonna stand, Zach and the team's gonna lead us out. I wanna encourage you to sing these words out and ask God to drop the truth of Philippians out of your head and into your heart. And then if you filled out that prayer card here in the room, if you don't mind, just drop it at the altar. And this week we'll be praying for you. Next Sunday, we're gonna take some time to practice praying over these. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Help us to fix our eyes on you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. Let's stand together as we sing this out.